All right, um, and we're getting the live stream ready, Tom? Very good. Thanks very much. So welcome, everybody. My name is Lisa Polk. I'm the Director of Pastoral Services for the Archdiocese of Regina, and I am very pleased tonight to be introducing Megan McKenna. Megan is an internationally known storyteller, writer, theologian, and we are just very blessed, especially during COVID, to have her come to Canada and speak with us tonight and share some stories and and get us talking a little bit too. So looking forward to hearing what uh, Megan has to share with us. And uh, so I ask you to join me in welcoming Megan McKenna. Am I on now? Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, good evening, and thank you for coming or staying. Um, hang on a second. I'll stick it in my pocket. Um, it's going to be a little awkward tonight um, to kind of, everything in the scriptures is based on talking to each other. Um, so I know you're all spread out, but if you can get so you are one seat beyond people so that you could turn around and talk to the people behind you or beside you. So you have to kind of move, and it would help if you all sort of came forward. Like you can talk to him and you know, you can talk to you, that kind of thing. And this is interesting because we're going to talk about what, what it is people are experiencing, separation from other people, and yet how do you talk about communion in that kind of a situation? So if you can get close enough to somebody to talk to, and then um, what I'm going to do tonight is we're going to talk about forgiveness. And forgiveness is the first step of four experiences in what forgiveness is. So we're going to do the first step today, forgiveness that leads into reconciliation. Then tomorrow we're going to look at reconciliation that leads into restorative justice, or what is called tikkum olan in the Jewish community, which is repairing the world, and how that leads into what we used to call atonement, but is at one meant communion. So we'll try to do two of them tonight and two of them tomorrow so that you can get the, the sense of the whole thing. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction on theology to kind of set you up and then I'm going to tell a story. And after I tell the story, um, I'm going to ask you to react to it, um, your feelings and thoughts and that sort of thing, and then to talk back to me. So you, you know, you got your mask on, but try to articulate and speak loudly for your community. And then I'm going to do a scripture passage that you are very, very familiar with, but we're going to do it in a little bit different way so that you hear it different and experience it differently. And then we will talk about that, and then I will try to close it all up with a story. So that's what we're going to try to, to, to do. Um, most of us, when we think of forgiveness, we think of the sacrament of forgiveness. But forgiveness is the reality of the gospel, of the good news of God, that God has forgiven us and again, we think of forgiving for the past or what has been done, but it is we are given for the life of God. Instead of just being forgiven, we are given for the life of God. Uh, when Jesus goes into the synagogue, his hometown synagogue in Nazareth, and he stands up and begins to proclaim what he's going to be about, what he's trying to teach and preach and live, and us, he begins with good news to the poor and then liberate the captives. And liberating the captives is what forgiveness is, setting us free from anything that uh, separates us from God, separates us from each other, separates us from the fact that we are all one in God. So it's, forgiveness is much bigger than asking forgiveness for what we've done or forgiving someone for what they've done. And we're going to try to look at that. Um, when I was talking to the bishop uh, yesterday, we, 
he said, give me a definition in one line. And I, I said, I think I can. Forgiveness is God's mercy extended as a lifestyle. That forgiveness is God's mercy that we live in such a way that other people begin to experience God's mercy. Okay? So forgiveness isn't something like tomorrow we're going to look at the lines of how many times do I have to forgive? And it's like forgiveness isn't something you can count. Forgiveness is a lifestyle that you have to get into and think about it all the time, live it all the time, practice it all the time. Um, and that's, that's what forgiveness is. Um, again, we're going to talk about forgiveness that leads to reconciliation. The word reconciliation means to walk together again, uh, mutual forgiveness. But the, the Greek word that for walking together again, if you've ever done a three-legged race, you know, two people tie their legs together and walk, that's reconciliation. That people who have been separated by what has happened to them, what they've done, what they have experienced, the forgiveness binds us close together in such a way that we walk together again, literally sharing one leg, right? So leads to reconciliation and mutual forgiveness. And then when, we, when you went to confession in the old days, you were given a penance. Um, usually it was five our fathers, two Hail Marys, say, if you were really bad, say the rosary or something. But penance is what they now refer to as restorative justice. Um, it's like undoing the harm that has been done. Something very pragmatic, very practical and down to earth. Undoing the harm that has been done repairing the world. That's the Jewish phrase for it, tikkun olam, to how do you repair the world that has been broken or torn apart or just separated. And so that leads into restitution or what is called restorative justice. And when that is practiced by people, then again, what they used to call make atonement, it's, the word is at one mint. How do we live in communion again uh, as one people? Right? Um, that's sort of the basis of, of, of it overall. Now, that's theology. Now, I know you're separated from each other and that sort of thing, but try to turn to somebody you know, behind you or next to you and share with them something you just heard. Whether you agree with it or you don't buy it for a minute, you never heard it before, um, just share something that is getting you thinking and wondering about things. Try to talk to each other for a minute or two. You may have to talk louder, forget you're in church. Okay, now it's a little harder. I'd like you to share with me what you've heard. I've learned over the years that when I say something, if there are 20 people in front of me, they heard 20 different things. But that's good because that's what makes community. Everybody needs to hear what other people heard and that for most of us we learn when we 
not just share what we heard, but listen to what somebody else heard. That opens a world up. Um, and the whole, scripture is meant to be discussed with other people. You can come up with all kinds of ideas on your own, but they are very limited in scope and depth. And most of us, the more alike you are, the more you're gonna think alike, the more you're gonna feel alike, the more you're gonna sin alike, the more you're going to get you know, the same sort of things that are good. So that anything, you'll hear some things from me, you'll share, share with others, but what you hear from other people is probably going to be the way the spirit is speaking to you the strongest, right? So what did you hear or what did you react to? What was new? Uh, anything bother you? That sort of thing. Now again, you've talked to one other person. The rule is anything anybody shares with you is now public property. So if you didn't come up with a brilliant idea and somebody else did, feel free, right? So what struck you? And I will try and hope the acoustics are good and your voice is loud. Think of proclaiming the good news. And don't be bashful. What the Lord gives you was given to give away. Yes. And that's the original meaning of the word. Over the years, especially in the Middle Ages, atonement was like, how do you make up for something, you know, and it, it all, had all kinds of connections to money and to um, res not even restitution, getting even atonement. So it, everything about God is making us one with God. And there's a saying that you're only as close to God as you are to the farthest people away from you. We're even made in the sign of the cross that we are only as close to God as we are when we stretch out and reach with other people. And again, we, we forget that. We concentrate a lot on our relationship with God and the rest of you turkeys, you know, a um, couple here and there, but we, we, we don't think in terms that God is a community. The Father, the beloved child, the spirit who is called wisdom. Our God is a trinity. So we think and become and act and even look more and more like God the more we are, are together. And the more a community is together, usually the more diverse it is. God loves diversity, not sameness. He's not into a homogenous grouping, which we forget. All right, what else did you hear or react to or hear from your neighbor or whatever? Right, the three-legged race. To think of reconciliation as a three-legged race, you know, first of all, it's hard. You know, and it's clumsy, and it's awkward, and you fall a lot. But once you get the rhythm, and once you get the pace, it's almost like a dance. And that reckons, that's what reconciliation is. In the church, reconciliation is also called second baptism. That every time you are reconciled with someone, you experience something like a second baptism. We'll talk more about that tomorrow night if you come. But the idea that this is, forgiveness is something we do with each other primarily. And the closer we do it with each other, the stronger the bond becomes with God. Maybe one more thing, anything that you, you heard or whatever, yeah. Okay, you you have to be, with, your, with the mic, it sounds better, you think, but because it's, it's coming through your mask, you have to. We really stuck with that 70 times seven. But what Jesus says back to Peter is like, can it? 
Stop counting. Start living. It is literally a shift of focus, a shift of how you do your life. Whereas sometimes, how many times do I have to forgive you? We're more into that than, you know, no. It's always everywhere, all the time. It, it reveals that Peter hasn't got it at all, right? And that this is our lifestyle, that this is the way we are to relate to each other. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. It's a First Nations story. I have been working for the last four years with the First Nations, with some of the bishops in the western part of Canada. So I have a lot of First Nations stories. I'm not going to tell you the name of the story because sometimes that gives away a lot of things. It's about a raven. A raven is a very, very strong image as a bird in all of the First Nation tribes, even in our country. Um, a raven, if, if you watch them, is a thief. A raven will steal anything shiny. They have found beer cans, pop tops, diamond rings, bracelets, everything in raven's nests. If it shines or if it sparkles, it'll, it'll, a raven will steal it. So a raven is a thief. When you hear a story, there are at least three levels you can hear it on with the ravens. So if, you're, if the raven's in the story, a raven is a thief. The other thing is a raven is everywhere. No, there, there is nowhere in the world. If, I've been out in the Marshall Islands in the middle of nowhere, 400 miles from Hawaii, where there are ravens. They are everywhere. And they sit in trees and listen. And so they say that it, the eye of the raven sees everything and also hears everything, so always knows what's going on. And so a raven appears when something has to do with telling the truth. Okay. And then the third one is God is a raven because God is everywhere, hears everything, but also the understanding is God is a thief. God is out to steal everything from you that gets in the way, that you don't need, that doesn't belong to you, that God is a thief. And so raven is is a thief. And then sometimes in the story, a raven is just a bird. All right? So keep that in mind as you're listening to the story. All right? And um, this comes from the very western part of Canada and down into Washington and Oregon. Um, and when you hear a story, just kind of put your story ears on and listen with your head and your heart together. And never, it's never logical. All right? Just so keep that in mind. Wherever you think it's going, uh -uh, ain't going there, all right? Once upon a time, Raven was out. He was just sort of checking things out and flying over places he hadn't been before, and he was always discovering new places and groups of people and places he hadn't been before, and he was always looking for food. And Raven was flying over some new territory, and he thought, I'm hungry. And he saw this cove that had nice trees around it. Didn't see any camps or people, but he thought, hey, wherever there is in the world is food. So he swooped down and landed in the clearing. Tall, tall trees. And he sniffed, and it was the smell of smoked salmon, which was one of his favorite smells. He kind of sniffed around a while, and sure enough, within a few minutes, he found a big smokehouse. Didn't see any people around, and he went in. And the smell was so good. It was set up with tables, and all along the walls was smoked salmon, hanging great slabs of them, little pieces, medium side. He thought, oh. He went and picked one of the biggest salmons he could, hauled it off the rack, dragged it over, and dropped it on the table. Then he landed on the table right beside the salmon and bent down with his beak to take a piece out of it and tear it off the salmon. And just as his beak got close to the piece of salmon, the salmon shot off the table and back up on the wall. And he looked at that and thought, what in the world? What happened? And he looked around, there wasn't anybody around, but his salmon was back on the rack. 
And he thought, hmm, let's try this again. But he didn't take the biggest one this time. He thought, oh, I'll go for medium size. So he got a nice one that looked really juicy and red, hauled it over, dropped it on the table. This time, he stood on it, make sure. And as he went to bite into it again, it shot out from underneath him and slammed up against the wall, back on this rack. He was beginning to get annoyed, but he was also beginning to get a little afraid. What was going on? What kind of spirits were in this place? He said, I'll try one more time. So one more time, he got a little one. And he put it down, put one little claw in there, and sure enough, as soon as he went for it, this time it slapped him in the face, and then shot back up on the wall. And he said, I'm out of here. I don't know what's going on, but I'm out of here. And so Raven flew out into the bright sunlight, kind of got his bearings again and said, where am I? What is this place? And then as he was kind of hopping around on the ground, he realized there was a, a, a black sort of piece of something on the ground he hadn't seen before. And it moved with him. Everywhere he moved, it moved. He hopped up and down, and this black thing went up and down. And then he flew to get away, and he realized it was following him on the ground. And he said, now I know where I am. I landed in the land of the spirits and shadows. And now I have a shadow. And they say, that Raven learned early, like most of us need to, that every one of us has a shadow. And he got it because he stole. He tried to steal what wasn't his. And so our shadow is a constant reminder that many of us go through life stealing from others what isn't ours. Do you have a shadow? What are you really? What do you spend your life stealing from other people? Because like Raven, you've got a shadow. That's how Raven got a shadow, right? Now, whenever you hear a story, it does a couple of things to you. It's like, uh, what does that mean? It bothers you. It, make, it makes you laugh sometimes, makes you think. Uh, you know, pushes you in all kinds of different directions. So why don't you take a minute and now have a little chat with your neighbor again. What does the story make you feel? Don't think so much. What does it make you feel? And, and then what in the story bothers you? Have a little chat again.
Okay, what does the story do to you? What does it make you feel? A good lesson. Pardon? A good lesson. A good question. <laughs> lesson. lesson. What lesson? Okay, he didn't get any food, but he got a good lesson. And there are lots of ways to get fed. We get fed by food, but we get fed by stories. We get fed by the scriptures. We get fed by relationships. We get fed by experiences, all sorts of things. So he did get a lesson that he'll never forget, but he didn't get fed. And so oftentimes in our lives, what we go after is not what we get, but what we got was more than we ever bargained for. All right, any other things with the stories? Oh, you shadow people. I was really curious about the aggressiveness of the family. <laughs> she said she was really intrigued by the aggressiveness of the salmon. Now, when, for most of us who are not First Nations people, we don't relate to animals, birds, and fish, the land, plants, trees, etc., like they're anything like us at all in any way, shape, or form. We think of us, they belong to us, and we can do anything we want with them. You know, we never think of them having some sort of a relationship with us, and especially one that can be aggressive. Yep, and the salmon is very aggressive. Now, in the whole Northwest, territories of the, both the United States and the Northwest Territories in Canada, salmon <clears throat> are one of the sacred things. Salmon is one of the things that holds the entire ecosystem together. Um, and we don't even think like that. We think who's eating salmon for tomorrow night's dinner? You know, or was it farm fed? <clears throat> you know, or is it wild caught kind of thing? But the stories all reveal that our relationship with things other than human beings are as strong and as important as everything else in the world. God made everything, and they're all good. And then when he got to us, we're very good. Hopefully. Right? Yeah, so it's like we just don't think uh, in terms of, you know, the effect that other things are having on us. And yet now, with ecology becoming so important and allowed out to see, and about the earth and what we have done to the environment, it's, it's beginning to dawn on some of us that uh, we have a terrible relationship with absolutely everything else in the world. And that we have to start balancing and putting that back into harmony so that we are aware of how we relate to each other whether it's water, whether it's fish, whether it's, you know, the trees outside, whatever, everything is beginning to talk to us. And in some ways, the shifts in weather patterns are about as aggressive as the salmon get. It needs to tell us what's going on. Maybe one more thing about the, the shadow. Yeah, what do you say about the small fish? He didn't get, he thought he went from the biggest medium size to the smallest. He thought, well, maybe if I do less or I take something different, it'll work. But if you notice, the smallest one is the one that slaps him in the face before it goes back on the thing. And again, we have this tendency to, and we relate, the, you know, the way Raven relates to the fish is sometimes how we relate to each other, right? We think, well, don't take so much. Don't go for the big fish. All right, you know, well, we do a little medium size. And then in a pinch, if we still are trying to do it, then we go for the least thing there. And sometimes the thing that is the smallest or the least packs the biggest wallop. But again, it's the stories tell us the truth on, in levels about ourselves. And uh, we need to hear many, many more stories. Jesus' best preaching is stories. They're just marvelous. And we're going to do one of the parables that Jesus tells, which you have all heard a thousand times. A parable is a story 
that starts off normal. You know, it's like, okay, I know what he's going, where, where this is going or whatever. And then there's a little hint here and there's a little hint there and things begin to get weird. Things go off. And then by the time you get to the story, the ending is such a shock. It's like somebody pulled the rug out from underneath you and you fell on the floor. And you're thinking, how did I get there? So a, any parable that you like that Jesus tells and you think is nice, you didn't get it. Jesus does not know any nice stories. Not at all. He's not into that at all. The one we're going to tell is called the prodigal son, the prodigal father, you know, all that sort of thing. But we're going to do the story, and perhaps you will hear it like you never heard it before. And I'll give you a little background as we go along. But we're going to do it a little differently. Everybody on this side of the church is the younger son. You're the ones that go off and do dissolute living, all right? So you're the younger son, and everybody over here is the older son who stays at home and is a real mean sucker, all right? So that's the way we're going to tell it, all right? And so as you hear the story that you've heard before, think of yourself as a younger son or a younger daughter, and you think of yourself as the older one, all right? So, and this is the scripture, so close your eyes for a minute and ask the Spirit and the Word to open your ears and to open your heart and to open your mind so that you can hear the good news of God. All right, open your ears. Now, the sinners, the prostitutes, and the tax collectors were all coming close to Jesus to hear him speak. But the Pharisees and the elders, they began to murmur among themselves and say to each other, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so Jesus turned on them and he told them this story. A man had two sons. And the younger son came to his father and said, give me my share of the inheritance that's coming to me. And the father did. And so the younger son took the inheritance, sold it, turned it into cash, and went off and left. And he began to squander everything he had gotten in dissolute living. And then a famine hit the place and struck hard and he lost everything and was reduced to hiring himself out to somebody local to take care of the swine and he was so hungry all he wanted to do was to eat some of the and what was left over from the pigs but nobody offered him anything finally he came to his senses and thought to himself Back home, on my father's land, even the hired hands have enough, more than enough food, and here I am, starving to death. I'm going to go home. And so he thought to himself, I'm going to say, I'm going to go home and see my father, and I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against earth. I'm no longer worthy to be your son, but you can hire me on to the land, and I'll work on the land. I'll also get paid. And so that's what he did. He decided to go home. But as he was coming home, his father saw him from a long way off, and the father ran out to see him. The boy tried to say, I have sinned against God, and I've sinned against heaven and earth. I'm not really, cut him off. Immediately, he summoned the servants. Bring the best robe, bring his sandals, <clears throat> bring his signet ring, give them all to him. And then go and get the fatted calf and kill it because we are going to have a feast. We are going to celebrate. Let it begin. And so the music and the dancing began and the celebration began. Meanwhile, <clears throat> back in the fields, the older son was taking care of the land, <clears throat> and he heard the music and the dancing and was wondering what was going on. 
<clears throat> one of the servants came to him and said, your brother's home and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's so overjoyed that he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother was livid. He was furious and he absolutely refused to go in. Had nothing to do with it. So the father had run out to the other one. Now the father goes out to the older son and begins to plead with him to come in. But the older brother says, I've slaved for you my whole life. I've obeyed every command you gave me, and you, you never even gave me a kid to celebrate with my friends. And yet when that son of yours goes off and squanders his, your, inherit, your money with prostitutes, you kill the fatted calf for him. And the father said, you have been with me from the very beginning. Everything I have is yours. It's all there. But this brother of yours was lost. And now he's found. That brother of yours was dead. Now he's alive. That's the story. Now, what I want you to do is, you're the young one, you're the elder one. First of all, how do you feel about your brother? All right, first thing, how do you feel about your brother? How do you feel about the father? All right, so take a minute and talk to each other. How do you feel about your brother? And how do you feel about the father? It's not real hard to get into, believe me. <laughs>
Okay, now listen very carefully to what other folks say, all right? You'll learn a great deal about yourself and other people too. All right, I'm gonna start with the young one, all right? Because that was the brash one that set the whole thing in motion. How do you feel about your older brother? What's he like? What's your relationship with him? Why did you leave? Okay, you're the goody two shoes of the family, and there's no way that they could live up to you, you know, you people. Again, you know, this is this is when Jesus tells stories, it's about life, and you can find yourself in it all the time. Right? What else is it? What's it like? How do you feel about your older brother, and why did he leave, and wh what are you like? Okay, it's very hard. I, I think I know what you're trying to say. It's very hard to forgive. There's no way you can forgive yourself. I hate to tell you this, but we think we can forgive ourselves. But you, there's no forgiveness without other people. You can learn to accept what you did and live with it. But forgiveness is a gift that's given from someone else. And, so it, and it's very hard for us to, to live with the fact sometimes of what we have done or what we haven't done. But we, psychology tells us that we can forgive ourselves. God says, no, I forgive you, and everybody else forgives you, just like you forgive everybody else. Right? Does that make, make sense? Yeah. But we really, ha we, we operate as though we can do it ourselves. And, but the thing is, how to, and the learning to live with what we've done take responsibility for what we've done is an integral part of forgiveness because until you've accepted what you've done or what you didn't do, you can't undo the harm you did. Again, what we do always has ramifications and effects on other people, but most of us are unaware of them and we don't want to become aware of it. So, but until we accept, okay, I got to learn to live with this, then how do I undo the, that harm to somebody else? And this kid is rotten. When he goes to his father, I mean, when do you inherit something? When they die. What he does is he goes to his father and says, I want you dead, give me it now. I mean, and we don't even think of that, but that's what he tells his father. Give me my share of the inheritance now. He said, die. I want it now. What you don't know in the story is at the time of Jesus, number one son always inherited everything. And along with the inheritance and the responsibility came um, a great deal of, of what was expected of the son that took up the name, took up the family, you know, traditions, etc. It was tacitly understood that once the older son inherited, it was expected that then the older son would turn around and share it uh, with all of the other uh, siblings in the house, right? And in exchange, it was like becoming a father early and taking over the responsibilities of the younger members of the family. So, but he's, and so what the father does, treating them both equally, Everyone listening to this story would have looked at each other and said, this is one weird father. He's breaking all the rules. He's treating them both the same way, as though they are equal. You get your share, you get this share. So that's the first <coughs> in the story. Right? What else do you feel about the young one, younger one? And again, remember, if you got an idea from somebody else, feel free. Most of us in the story like to think we're the younger one, that we've done, you know, our sowed our wild oats and went off and dis. How are you at dissolute living? It's a word that's not used too often. <laughs> and he, he, he shoots it, you know, he blows us the whole thing, and then he's reduced to nothing, right? 
when he, and, and he's so down on, the, on it that he'd eat pig slop. Now, in the Jewish community, every, to eat pork is taboo, right? It's a, for a lot of dietary reasons and whatever. But the fact that he is willing to eat anything at this point says how far he's gone down and how bad he is, just physically and whatever. The line that most people react to, he came to his senses. What kinds of things bring you to your senses? Again, everybody says, oh, he can, got converted. No way. He was listening to his stomach and trying to find a way home. There is no conversion of the younger boy in the story at all. None. He comes to his senses and thinks, hmm, back on the land where my father still is and him, they've got hair, hired hands who are eating better than I am. And I'm starving to death. I, can, I got a way I can do it. I can go home and do a little false, you know, humble pie with my father. This is what I'll say to my father. I've sinned against heaven and against earth. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's to kind of cover your bases. And then he says, you can hire me on as hired help, which means he will get fed an older brother who has lost half of his inheritance will now pay him as a hired hand on the land. This is like rubbing salt in the wound, right? It's like I can get what I need and what I want. I, you know, I'll look good sort of with my father, but I'm going to keep nailing it to him. That's his reason for going home, a canned confession. You ever go to confession and think, now, what can I say? That assumes you're going to confession, <laughs> you know, on, on occasion. All right, so he goes home, and this is where the, the turning point in the story comes. The father sees him from a long way off. The way uh, things were set up geographically was all of the families would live close together. This is the way the First Nations do it, too. All the families are together in, in little clusters, very close together. Then the, the town businesses and, you know, uh, services were the next thing out. Then all the open fields, right? So if he sees them from a long way off, that means that every day the father left the compound, so to speak, went through the town, went through the fields looking for his son. Now, the reason he does that, he inherited, uh, your inheritance has to do with the promised land, right? The promised land, if you g gave up or sold a piece of the promised land, you didn't just leave your family. You left your nation, you left the Jewish community. Even today, think of what goes on in Israel, right? He has severed himself from the Jewish community, from the nation, from the people, as well as from his family. And so the father goes out every single day, hoping his son is coming back for protection. He would have been dumped with garbage. He would have been cursed. Some people say he would have been stoned as he came back. So the father goes out every single day, humiliating himself in front of the whole community in hopes that the kid will come back and they'll protect him as he comes in. Again, this is when it begins to talk about what the father's like, right? So the father runs out to grab him and still, you know, he's got his canned little speech ready, can't even get through it. And immediately um, he turns to his servants, right? You got servants, he's got servants, and he says, bring the best robe pair of sandals, and a ring. The gifts from the father make you the elder son. The person who got the sandals, there was only one pair, was the one who had dealings with other people, businesses, that sort of thing, so you need a pair of sandals. Same with the robe. You wore the robe in public. You wore it for business transactions, you, for family uh, gatherings, for religious ceremonies. 
and the ring is the signet ring that would transfer property, um, adopt people, that sort of thing. He handed him three symbols of power that would have given you, um, made you the elder in the community. Again, now take up the responsibilities and as well as the, the, the good things that came along with it. And, and notice the boy takes them right away. No, you know, he's not picky, he takes it. And then anything that happens in the family happens in the whole community. Get the fatted calf, kill the fatted calf. Have you ever been to a crochon de lait? Uh, they're big in New Orleans. They kill the fatted calf and the pig and things like that. The entire community shows up and you start drinking and making merry and dancing. And while everything is cooking, you begin the partying and the dancing. So this is what he sets in motion, celebration of what is going to happen because his son is back safe and sound. And then the music and the dancing triggers all of this. So meanwhile, this is like in an old time movie, meanwhile, back in the hills, all right? Um, now we've got the, uh, these are the elder members of the family. What is it, well, how do you feel about this character? Jealous. Jealous. A lot of people who look good, act good, do what they're supposed to, would really love to be doing that. All right? So there's a streak of jealousy, like, and especially in the story, not only did you get away with it, you came out ahead. You now got more than he's got. He lost half of what he had and, and what he had worked hard at. And then suddenly the father is not, you don't, you're not getting all the good stuff. You're not getting the sandals. You're not getting the robe. You're not getting, you know, the signet ring. He's got it already. How else do you feel about? What a brat. What a brat. All right. Well, you know, this is the way things are. I mean, I come up from a very large family. And it's a nightmare. And half of them happen to live on the East Coast and half live on the West Coast. And one lives in Colorado and I live in New Mexico. And there, there were a lot of us. We were dying at this point, but, it, but the, the, it's a mess. And it is, they're the older ones. There's one group, you know, that when there's an 18 to 20 year spread between the youngest and the old, oldest, it's really weird. I mean, it's like living in two different worlds with all the problems that go with it, all right? So you're a brat. Any other words you could think of to describe this character? Selfish, wrapped up in your own world, care about nobody but yourself, and dis how do you feel about people who live dissolute lives? That's everything from getting drunk on a regular basis to being addicted that becomes a disease that you can't control. It is thievery. It's, you know, doing anything possible. He's at such, you're at such a, a, at the end of your rope, you'd even eat the worst stuff in the world from people you detest in order to, to make it go. If you really were honest, even though you're, you know, if you're in church, you'd have a few things to say about yours truly over here. Anything else you feel about? And you people let him off, let, get, let these people off easy. What's it like? What? Rejection, I don't want to have anything to do with him. Right, don't want to have anything to do with you. That's why he won't come in, All right? He's out in the field. He, he won't even come in and part. He, he will not rejoice in anybody else's good fortune, especially if he sees it as not helping out here. Right? So utter rejection. I right? don't want to have anything to do with them. So the best thing to do is ignore them. And so you don't go, you don't celebrate, you don't do anything. You just, you know, get moaning and groaning out in the field. And listen to, to and, and this is Luke's gospel. Luke's gospel has two servants in, in, the, in Luke's gospel. The singing servant, who is Mary, and the suffering servant who is Jesus. And in this story, it is a servant who comes to tell 
this your brother's home and your father's overjoyed and has killed the fatted calf and started the celebration. In the Old Testament, what happens to most servants who announce this kind of news? You know, all of the other stories, they kill the servants who bring the good news. So the, the story has Jesus himself in there bringing good news, and it's like total rejection. No, not going to go in, nothing. The father comes out. He ran out to meet you. Now the party's going full swing, and the whole town would know he's out in the field. This man has two sons. Both of them are rotten. You get to choose which rotten you get to be. You can go rotten in this route, or you can go rotten in this route. Okay. So he comes out, and he begs, and he pleads, come in, come in. And what does the son say? I've slaved for you my whole life. I've obeyed every single command you ever gave me, and you never once gave me even a kid to celebrate with my friends. But he goes home, who squandered your money, and he adds in a few things with prostitutes, and you kill the fatted calf for him. This one tells his father to kick off and die. This one says, I've been a slave to you my whole life. I hate your guts, but I obey because I want what's coming to me. And you, you, you treat him totally different than you treat me. And so the father says, everything I've had is yours. Everything. And then comes the killer lines, all right? We have to celebrate. He keeps saying, that son of yours, that son of yours. And the father keeps saying, no, that brother of yours, that brother of yours was lost. Now he's found. That brother of yours was dead. Now he's alive. The undercurrent is, you're still lost and you're still dead. And that's the story. It ends. This is not a happy ever after story. To, this is the way Jesus is describing. Now remember, this story is told sitting at a table, eating with them. And the sinners and the tax collectors and everybody are having a feast with Jesus. They're listening, to, hanging on his every word. And the good folk, the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious people, murmur, murmur, murmur against Jesus, and their opinion of Jesus is he welcomes people like that and eats with them. It sort of shifts the whole story. Now, you've heard the story a little bit differently. Um, the understanding of a parable is the story begins when the teller stops talking. So it's at this point that the story begins. You're all out in the field still. You're refusing to go in. You're in partying to beat the band and could care less. And the father is still trying to get this one, get this one, get them back together again. So in this kind of a situation, if the story begins now, you folk over there, what can you do? How do you, how do you pick up the story from here? What can you do right now? And how do you? You're out in the field. What are you going to do? There are at least five options you can do and five things you can do to pick up and continue the story. Close your eyes for a minute. Ask the spirit to kind of inspire you. If this is actual reality, what, what, what could I do? And then be brave and daring and try again, talk to your neighbor. What, what can you do to continue the story? To make the story worth coming true?
Okay, what are some of the things that can happen in the story to make the story come true? This is why Jesus tells parables. The parable leaves you at the point of, what do I do now? All of Jesus' stories are trying to say, make a decision. Are you with me? Do you reject me? Do you believe in what, who I am and what I'm saying and doing? Uh, so a parable gets you. The parable, as you listen to it, puts you in God's kingdom. And then at the end of the parable, you've got to decide if you're going to stay. Or if you're going to, eh, I think I'll, I visited, I'm leaving. Right? And so all of the stories are setups. All of the Pharisees and the leaders knew what Jesus was doing. But they were so fascinated by the stories, they, they stuck around and got slammed again and again. Right? And again, Jesus is sitting at the table with one group trying to force the other group to deal with both groups to deal with each other. He's constantly trying to reconcile and pull them back together again, whether they're separated by religion, by caste, by money and economics, by, you know, nationality, by who's holy and who's not, who's a sinner and who's not. I don't know anybody who isn't, but most of us would, you know, kind of blur that over. He's more of a sinner than me or you're more than a sinner than whatever. And so he's constantly trying to reconcile and to pull people back together again. Uh, when I've done this with people, they've come up with 10 possibilities to turn the story. What, what does the Spirit tell you you could do? Because the father can do something, the older one can do something, the younger one can do some things. Let's start with the older one, since we're out in the field, you'll still party in. What can the older son do? In the story, it starts out he refuses to go in. So that's the first thing, he can refuse to go in. The father will have no effect on him whatsoever. Doesn't listen, doesn't, he, he detests his father. And he will continue to humiliate him by not going back in. And again, the older brother should never have let his younger brother leave. Because of being an older brother, it was expected the older brother would go after the younger one and bring him home and keep the family together. So he's already humiliated his father by not doing that and then watching his father go out every day trying to get the son back. So, and staying out, he's humiliating in front of the whole town all over again. Come on, what, what are some of the things you people could do? Be honest. Hmm? Okay, there are two ways. You can go back in, all right? Uh, most people would not go back in and make a scene because he's already spent a great deal of his life looking good. I've never disobeyed one of your commands, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He's, he's been doing everything not because he loves his father. He wants his inheritance. He just doesn't have the guts to, to do what the other one did, saying, kick off and give it to me now. Right? So he, he can go back in. He can go back in and make nice and fake it all the way. And by this time, the father's going to die. He's going to get what he wants. So he can go back in and fake it, or he can actually go back in and reconcile with the younger one. Is it harder for the older one to forgive the younger one? Or is it harder for the younger one to forgive the older one? If the older one has more rigid thoughts and uh, like you say, a, a pair of jeans and all this. Mm -hmm. stuff, yeah, he's, ri he's rigid, he's stuck. He's also heavily invested in a way of living that would, again, we're talking about conversion change that's a he's heavily invested it's hard it's like it's going to break everything you have to be humble and make the first step to forgive right humble and be the first step 
First step for anybody in every situation is the hardest. Always. It's letting go of something crucial that you've invested heavily in. One of the things he has to learn is at least open the door to all his father has done for him. He's utterly lacking in gratitude. Everything I have is yours. You know, you've been with me all this time. Many of us just don't realize that. We, we don't appreciate not only our own families, but we don't appreciate God. And the fact that everything we have, we did not work for. God has graciously given us everything, starting with our life, you know, on a daily basis. So one of the things he can start doing is acknowledge for the first time. He starts off so mean-spirited and selfish. I've sl his relationship with the Father is I'm a slave, and you're the slave master, and I've done everything I'm supposed to do. What's wrong with you? Rather than, no. I've given you everything. It's just, you didn't, you didn't take it. How, how much do we not take from God, but how much do we not take from each other that is offered? Anything else? Okay, let's try the young ones. What, do you, what can you do? Okay, or, hang on a sec, let's do one at a time. He, he can actually come to his senses. He can begin to realize, I'm a crumb, I'm a schmuck, all right? I have done all these rotten things and my father still not only cares for me, bends over backwards to help me, you know, gives me more than anything I could imagine. So he could literally come to his senses. First time he goes back because he's hungry. And he figures he can get a deal. He doesn't have to cope with the fact that he got, took half of his brother's inheritance, you know, and then makes his brother pay him on the land. He can actually come to his senses and, again, change his relationship with his father like this guy needs to do. Again, it has to do with gratitude. Realize so much has been given, and I just threw it away, or I just didn't even appreciate it. And what was the other one? Right. Back, not because, oh, I miss my family and I, hmm. I miss them and I did so wrong and in fact, no, he came back and said, no, I can get this and I can get this. Right. He can say, okay, I deserve this. Right. Okay. He, yeah. yeah, he can get away with it. I got a good deal going. I got half the inheritance, had my splurge. I come back. Not only that, I'm still milking them. Now I've got the signet ring. Now I got the sand. Just because you experience God doesn't necessarily mean you repent. Sometimes other people can do the most incredible, amazing things for you, and you still just thumb your nose at them and say, eh, you know. So he can just refuse, you know, and think, I'm enjoying the party. Let's, let's see what's going to come next. That feeling of entitlement that so many people have, that I'm entitled. Yeah, I'm entitled. You know, and again, that doesn't necessarily just go away, poof. Anything else the younger one can do? I'm not going to be able to hear you. Acoustics in this place are not good. Give. Right. He can take what the father gave him, something, and gift it to the other brother. He can do the signet ring, so he still has the, the, the reputation, the, the, the experience of others. He's still the number one in the family. He can give him the signet ring. He can gift him with something the father gifted him with and make an overture. 
And he doesn't even need to do it himself. He doesn't have to go out and give it. He can send a servant out and say, this is a gift from your father. That was the way things were done. The gift uh, exchanges, you could take one of the servants and say, would you mind going out and field gifts us to my brother? So, I mean, it helps if you do it face to face, but in, in the tradition in many cultures, you have somebody else give the gift. There's a saying in all the native cultures, a gift is not a gift till it's been given at least twice. It's a marvelous line. A gift is not a gift until it's been given at least twice. So make some sort of a peace offering. Anything else? What about all the people at the party? Somebody else can make the first move. Somebody who's a friend of, of one of the younger one or a friend of the older one or even a friend of the father, right? can make an overture and either go out and talk to them, you know, and try to bring them in, or talk to the one who's partying and say, you know, let's go out and talk to your brother. The community is much more important than just what's going on in a relationship, whether it's one and one or whether it's a family or whatever. I mean, basically what Jesus is saying is those who follow him, we're supposed to be looking out for each other. We are all the brothers and sisters of Jesus, and Jesus is our elder brother. And so our lifestyle should be, how can we help bring people together, make peace, you know, share some sort of things with each other? Um, the whole understanding is, is it a party to celebrate because of who's not there? Whenever you go out to dinner, is it more important on what's on the menu or is it who you eat with? And every, he's pushing this to say, what is Eucharist supposed to look like? Who's supposed to be in here? Who's supposed to be? We're all supposed to be eating together as family. And so we have to spend our lives every single day making sure that we're bringing people back home. When I started working on this, it's like, this is not the prodigal son or the prodigal son, whatever. It's the parable of the family reunion, or it's the parable of, come in, dinner's ready. I want you in here in the next 10 minutes. Right? It is come home to the feast. And Jesus is trying to get the, the good people, the scribes and the Pharisees and whatever, to come in and sit down at the table with the ones that are considered tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners, etc., And it, trying to say, we're all in the same thing together. And that God wants us to eat together, live together, love together, and spend our lives forgiving and being at peace at one minute together. That is what communion, all forgiveness, all conversion is to end in communion. That somehow the closer we become to one another, somehow the closer we have become to God. Communion is not taking a piece of bread and going back to your thing by yourself. It's, it's feasting on the body of Christ and sharing that with everyone, everyone else. And it's like anything else, whenever you go to a party, usually you're acutely aware of who's not there. Someone once described church. You know you have church when you know who's missing every time you gather. And that it's bringing all the lost and whatever home. Now, if that's true, what, what is the good news of God telling us in this kind of a story? Take a minute and try to do a little theology and come up with, wow, I think this is what God's saying and what I should be doing and living. Take a minute and try it out on your older, younger brother. See how you're doing, sister. Sister, and see how you're doing.
Okay, where are you? By the way, that's the first question. When, I, when Adam and Eve are lost in the garden, God goes walking in the garden in the cool of the evening and says, where are you? And it is not a geographical location question. So where are you? What has sort of sifted into your spirit and is bubbling up there? Trust the spirit. Whatever the spirit gives you is to be given away. Pardon? The importance of family. Okay, now be a part of the family. How? See, that's the thing. We sort of know what the answer is, but the trick is how. Um, we just finished in the Jewish community celebrating Rosh Hashanah, which is the, one of the high holy days for the Jewish community. Before the day of fasting and then celebrating in prayer, asking for forgiveness to start a year of blessing over again, um, everyone in the community goes and offers forgiveness to everyone else individually in the community or asks forgiveness from anyone they have even the slightest inkling needs to be told, you know, that they are sorry. We're not good at it. We're not good at offering forgiveness and we're not good at asking for it. Usually when I teach this class, the first thing I start with is the question, do you find it harder to forgive someone or do you find it harder to accept forgiveness from someone? And everybody has their own kind of, yeah, huh, you know, that kind of the walls go up and everything, but you gotta know which one you find harder. All marriage counselors say you don't go to bed angry, you know? that you gotta say something before you go to bed at night. Well, it's, it, that works in, in the whole community. You know, and tomorrow we're gonna talk about reconciliation. We're not used to doing that. We have trouble doing it just in our family or in a marriage or a, you know, between two good friends. And practice giving forgiveness and practice asking for it. Uh, when I was teaching years and years ago in San Francisco for homework one day, this is a college classroom, I sent everybody out on the streets of San Francisco and I said, you're not allowed to, to say anything to the people you meet on the street except every person you meet, you are to say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. They, they were blown up. They, you have to try it sometime. All right, they were walking down the street. First of all, they felt like idiots, you know, but once they got started, what it was doing to them and what it was doing to every single person, I mean, a lot of people didn't do anything. They didn't respond at all. It was like, you know, what? Um, and yet that is the, a way of asking forgiveness, appreciating folk. Right, and it's been aggravated by COVID because why are people not here, you know? And yet we, we would check up on a handful of people besides our families. We have got to, forgiveness is extending mercy. And so our reach has to get wider and wider and deeper and deeper. And so it's a good way to start. It's like, all right, do we even know who's not here? You know, and, and to start thinking of that. What, who is your inner circle? You know, besides your family and a few friends. And, you know, it's a question of, we have to, the gospel, all right? It's like this group of people, you know, fire and brimstone down on them. And yet the, the reading in the Old Testament is, we want to get to know you because you're with God. God is with you. Are we living in such a way that people come near us and say, I want to be here because God's with you. I know it, right? And so again, it's like 
another thing COVID has done is turned us in, you know, um, and the, the walls have moved in. And we have to start taking the walls down and reaching, even if it's just, you know, look at people in the grocery store, look at people on the street, look at people. All right? And that's what will at least, we, it, it's, it's, a, it's a discipline, but it's also an art of how you learn to do it. And a good place to start is your family. And the people you go to school with, the people you work with, uh, we have to start stretching. Remember that our relationship with God is only as good as our relationship with others. That's why Jesus starts out by not loving your neighbor, but love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you and bless those you're afraid of. He's constantly saying, broaden your vision. Make it wider and wider. And when you go home tonight, even just in your heart, forgive everyone who needs to be forgiven. And think of who would be overjoyed, shocked out of their gourds, to hear you say, I'm sorry. Just to stir that within your soul. Ask the spirit to be honest with you. I'm going, I was going to tell a story, but I've gotten to know a woman who's very interesting. Her name is Joy Harjo. She is the poet laureate of the United States for the second time. She's a Muskegee Indian from Oklahoma. She also has her own jazz band and plays the sax. She's marvelous. She has a new book out and she has a new album out. But this is one of her, my favorite poems and hers. It's called, Perhaps the World Ends Here. And sometimes you can listen to poetry better with your eyes closed or whatever, but whatever you like, this is it. Joy Harjo. Perhaps the world ends here. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of the earth are brought and prepared and set on the table. So it has been since creation, and it will go on. We chase the chickens and the dogs away from it. Babies teeth on the corners. They scrape their knees underneath it. But it is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at the table. We make women at the table. And at this table, we gossip. We recall stories of enemies and the ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor, falling down selves and as we put ourselves back together again at the table. This table has been a house in the rain and an umbrella in the sun. Some of us have given birth on this table and prepared our parents for burial. At this table, we sing with joy and with sorrow. We pray of suffering and remorse, and we give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are laughing and crying and eating that last sweet bite. Go in peace, the peace of Christ, the only peace there is. Tomorrow we will do reconciliation and a little bit of restoration. I know you're all spread out all over creation. Have some people come to share the good news. And uh, we'll, we'll do some of the same tomorrow. We will do a scripture and we will do um, stories. Thank you. There's a saying among storytellers, if there is no one to listen, there's no story to tell. So may you go home tonight feeling forgiven and forgiving others and knowing that's what our God's like. Thank you so much, Megan.
So for those of you who are here present and those of you who are watching by live stream, tomorrow night we'll start at 7 p.m. again. And again, uh, welcome to come here to Resurrection Parish in person and uh, just wear a mask when you come to the parish and there's lots of room for you here. So hopefully you can invite your friends and if you're a distance away and joining us by live stream, I hope you've been able to have some conversations at home. So thank you again for coming and thank you to Resurrection Parish for hosting. Thank you very much. I know it's, it's hard to do this way, 